In this episode, we will be interviewing Jenny Wolfram. I met Jenny in the Hampton community and was fascinated by her story. In the last eight years, Jenny built Brand Bastion, and she's the CEO and founder of that MarTech SaaS business. Her clients include Uber, Netflix, North Face, and many other blue chip brands. And so in this episode, she will talk about her journey and also why she decided to move from Finland to LA two years ago, and also share what she does for professional and personal development. So enough of me rambling, let's dive into the episode. Hi, Jenny. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Great to have you here. Um, so you have an amazing background and an amazing story, and I would love to jump into that. Um, you obviously have a legal uh, background and you're the founder and CEO of Brand Bastion. Um, could you tell us a bit more about yeah, yourself and the founding story? Yeah, sure. So I was actually, I was uh, studying law back in the day. I was working at a law firm and there was a pharmaceutical company. Uh, I came across a case where they were being sued for harmful comments on their Facebook ads. And I started looking into it and I started um, seeing that there's a lot of ad spend being moved from more traditional channels to, to social media. And on these social media platforms, the comments actually become part of the ads. And it seemed to be a, a problem that um, many brands were struggling with. So then we started uh, really building a solution where brands would be able to have um, a technology to help them manage comments. Okay, awesome. So, and how did you go about building a SaaS business without having a technical background, right? Like a lot of the SaaS businesses out there, they usually have maybe like a product slash tech person and a business person. Yeah, how did you go about that? Yeah, so initially when I um, was looking into this problem, I was uh, reaching out to a lot of big brands, and mainly in the US. So I was looking at their Facebook, um, and they're like different um, comments and then I was sending them emails saying, hey, I'm noticing that you're getting like thousands and thousands of comments like and it seems like you're having a challenge managing them. Like, what are you doing? Like, what would you want to be doing ideally? And I got a few responses back saying, hey, you know, we actually don't have a solution. So then I asked them that, you know, if I were able to offer you this and like build this, would you be um, interested in being a customer? And then a few of them came back and said, uh, yeah, absolutely. And I also was able to um, get a few clients that were able to pay up front for three months. So with that uh, kind of commitment, I initially um, started uh, trying to learn how to code, trying to build it myself, but then that uh, I wasn't able to move at the speed that I wanted to. So then I was uh, able to find and hire uh, some great engineers with that. Uh, initial commitment from the clients and we were really uh, lucky in the way that we were able to build together with those first clients because that way we were able to ship really quickly because we had their commitment already and we had already taken their money and we were also in that way able to stay like super focused on the problem that we were solving. Cool. That's that's interesting. Yeah, a lot of founders usually, let's say non-technical ones, they might build the first iteration of the product by hiring an agency, for example, a web dev agency, and then maybe even the mm -hmm. second iteration, but you basically uh, got somebody in house, right? Straight away. And then together with the client's feedback, you did that. Okay. That's, that's awesome. And could you just walk us through then also like, okay, so you obviously work with a lot of big brands like Uber and um, a lot of, you know, really cool uh, logos on your website. Um, how did the, let's say product offering evolve so the very first product was what and then today obviously you have a suite of products um maybe yeah could you walk us through that a bit yeah sure so the very first offering was that uh you tell us what kind of comments are harmful um either from like a legal perspective or because you don't want them visible on your accounts and we will identify those comments and we will have them hidden so we were, uh, initially we were 
um, working with natural language processing and we were building different tracks for different types of verticals to be able to do this. And then gradually as we got more and more clients, they were saying, actually, we don't only want brand safety. We also want to be able to respond or have you guys respond to comments. So then we started building out this brand bastion care functionality where we can automate the handling of care inquiries. And then gradually a lot of clients were saying, actually, we really want to know what, what's being said across our different campaigns. And we also want to receive alerts if like an ad campaign suddenly gets like a high amount of negative comments or if there's like certain mentions of certain elements. So then we kept on building and kept on adding more functionality. And now, uh, you know, we support most platforms out there, including like LinkedIn, X, Instagram, YouTube, uh, we're building uh, out review functionality as well. So it's, yeah, it's been an evolution from a very specific solution to a suite helping brands manage their engagement on social media. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then in terms of, let's say, fundraising versus bootstrapping, I mean, you, you did raise a bit, is that correct? Yeah, so initially uh, when I started the business, it was, I had had a few like side businesses before uh, Brand Bastion, but it was still the first time that I was like really trying to build something at scale. So I seeked out, um, I think it was around seven entrepreneurs uh, with um, tech companies that had done very well. So I reached out to them to ask for advice in different areas. And then uh, we got to talking, we built um, a great relationship and then all seven actually ended up investing in the company. And we've been very lucky because we've been able to get like amazing advice, but also um, we were able to do two rounds of funding uh, with the support of these uh, great people. And we had uh, several times during our journey, we had the option and we also kind of a little bit played around with should we do like a big uh, VC round. But then um, we really had in our DNA this kind of thinking where we really built for um, our clients and where we also wanted to have the kind of freedom of doing that our, at our own pace. Um, which we felt, um, you know, makes sense for us. So then we decided not to go down the, the VC route. Uh, we also didn't want to be caught in like, um, kind of a situation where we would have to keep on fundraising because we wanted to spend like the, uh, the team's time on, on building. So mm -hmm. that's why we decided to go down this route, which is, uh, quite unconventional, especially in California where I'm based. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And I, obviously you, you have, you, I guess today you have you know, some competitors in your space, maybe some competing with one product of yours, for example, the more like the sentiment analysis, right? Like, and, and other players competing more maybe with the, you know, negative comments removal. Um, and some of them did raise yeah. bigger rounds, right? Do you think it's still a very yeah. fragmented market rather than a winner takes it all market? Or how do you kind of think about that? Yeah, things are changing, changing pretty fast. and. And there's also like, as you said, there are different types of competitors. So what we have built at Brand Bastion, we built a, a platform and then we basically built out our own uh, artificial intelligence that has been trained with millions and millions and millions of pieces of content and it's speci specialized per vertical. So we have uh, like a specific um, type of solution we offer for, you know, financial services, for e-commerce, for um, beauty for different types of brands. Uh, and then we also have over a hundred community managers that work on our platform and they basically continuously train, uh, data for our AI and they also verify actions and provide really high quality because when we're responding on the public domain on social media, there's no room for errors. So, um, if like, uh, just using, uh, AI is a risky move for a company when it's public because uh, that way there might be mistakes happening. So we have this combination where we offer like, um, we do all the work for you as a brand. So in this space, there isn't um, a clear like competitor, but then there's the big players like sprinklers, crowd social, um, you know, public companies that are uh, offering a platform. Um, so, and then there's like big agencies that offer to do the work. And then there's like Brand Bastion that kind of combines both. So we've kind of carved out uh, a space for ourselves in this way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what's the future in terms of, yeah, product features and how, yeah, in, in general, I guess, you know, on the one hand, 
you could argue that maybe some of the tech platforms might yeah buy another agency or the agency starts developing more like tech tools like yourself i mean because it's yeah it's a bit of a race like how, how do you kind of like yeah look into and plan yeah. the future yeah, it's definitely a race, especially now when there's so much AI functionality that is available open source. So yeah, we're really excited to be part of this race, especially as we're really uh, like being agile is a fundamental core part of who we are. So we actually, we work in like one week sprints. Uh, we're constantly evolving, changing, adapting uh, based on client needs. Uh, so we think we're very like well positioned in that way. But ultimately, it's all about delivering actual real results to clients. Um, and I think uh, I think we're moving more into a direction where companies want um, like full service solutions, where uh, where they are looking for um, not only kind of the tech piece, but also the the service piece um, mm -hmm. combined in one. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Makes sense. And so, from let's say a tech perspective and resource allocation perspective as well. Is there like a set percentage of revenue R and D spent every year you allocate towards, you know, new features development or how do you think about R and D in your business? Yeah. So we've, uh, for the past nine years, we've invested a lot in the R and D side. It's really, um, a fundamental part. So we have a, a, a team that focuses specifically on on this kind of functionality we don't have like a, a set budget um when it comes to um r d but it is something that we are is like a core uh, important part of, of what we do mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then in terms of i guess so you're originally from finland right and then two years ago you moved to la you live in a nice nice la vice beach um yeah, what, what uh, triggered this move and why did you not move, let's say, earlier, for example? Oh, yeah, um, I asked myself that as well because I absolutely love LA. Uh, I mean, we, we're born like global kind of distributed companies, so all our team members are working remotely. So initially when we started the company in Finland, it's a small market. It's um, So we really, from the beginning, decided that we want to just hire the best people we find, no matter where they are. Uh, but our clients have always been uh, primarily in the US. Um, so I think um, it was always in the cards that I would move here, but yeah, it took a while to, to make the actual final move happen. Mm -hmm. So, and then are you the only person in the US? So do you have, let's say, account managers and I don't know, customer success people in the, in the US yeah. maybe they were before you already there or? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we have a, a North American team that is, um, yeah, growing in size, and we've had that from the very beginning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And your, let's say, engineering team is based where? Uh, so they're distributed. So uh, they're in many uh, different countries, and uh, we really pride ourselves in being able to offer like as much twenty four seven support as possible to our clients. And to uh, always, you know, be have our um, platform online. So that's also why it's worked in our benefit to have team members in different time zones to be mm -hmm. able to offer this. Makes sense. Makes sense. So maybe let's touch base on, you know, again, you know, let's say growth. Uh, what can you tell us in terms of, you know, how did you get, you know, your first custom, I guess, based on the fact that you were working with some as a lawyer, right? That's how you got like your first customers and then you know without giving away any secrets um anything you can tell us in terms of you know what works for you what doesn't um have you tried many different channels and then you focus on a few uh yeah so i mean we didn't actually get our first clients through the the legal side we got them through just doing um research on what uh, companies are like the most highly engaged on social media okay. so it was all called outreach and our first uh, clients they included like um, the kind of tourism board of like a large English speaking government, like uh, um, one of the largest like online dating sites, and then as well uh, like a uh, hundred million plus like e commerce uh, company. So we were able to uh, acquire all these first clients uh, just through cold email outreach. Wow. Uh, so I do think like highly personalized 
um, email outreach is still something that that works really well um, when kind of done in in, in the right way. Mm. And we uh, yeah we try a lot of different channels uh, where you know constantly um, evolving as things change and as competition increases to see what's the best way of like really getting the attention of our customers. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, I guess it's interesting you're saying email marketing worked for you. I guess. Does it still work for you? It still works for us, yes. It just um, does require to be um, truly valuable. It does require a lot of like personalization and customization. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. And by that, um, by uh, email marketing, I, I yes, yeah, so by email marketing, we're also thinking about, you know, outreach through LinkedIn, outreach through um, X or outreach for other channels, but this kind of personalized um, called outreach where we're, we really identify that someone um, could benefit from our solution is still something mm -hmm. that works for us mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, let's say, obviously you have quite a few uh, customers, do you segment them also by size or just by verticals? Because I imagine, you know, there are e-commerce companies who maybe do only 500K a year, right? And then you have some which are 100 million a year, right? Like how do you differentiate between those two extremes and, you know, everything in between? Uh, yeah, so we basically, um, some of the things that we really uh, had to become good at is identifying like our ideal customer profile. Initially, like with most companies, when we started out, we just kind of wanted to work with everyone. Um, but then uh, over time, we realized that the kind of companies that can get the most uh, value of our um, solutions is someone that's um, receiving more than 5,000 comments a month across their social assets and someone that's uh, spending in paid advertising um, at least you know, a few hundred thousand uh, a year. So we kind of identified that um, that's where kind of this like customization speed automation can really have like a huge impact on like the return on ads, but on conversions, uh, mm -hmm. on customer retention. So, um, that's something that we really honed in on and yeah. And then in addition to like, um, looking at the different verticals, we are looking at as well at kind of the, um, the maturity of, of the brand, because, uh, if a brand is very well known, um, and then they get certain types of comments, people react in a different way than when it's a newer brand and they're just kind of learning about the brand and they're kind of trying to look at the comments to make a purchasing decision. So we also kind of segment based on, on that sort of behavior. Mm -hmm. Okay. Makes sense. That's really interesting. Yeah. So you actually do work more with yeah, larger enterprise, right? More than with the same list. Yeah. We have a lot of uh, fast growing disruptors though, like in the D2C space and they especially find value in kind of when they're quickly scaling, they're increasing spend, they have a sudden um, flux of interest, that's when something like brand question can really uh, be super helpful. So, uh, but it is, we typically work with brands that are already at a certain uh, type of scale. Mm -hmm. And then how did you come up with, let's say the pricing strategy? I guess you have different tiers and then also based on the solution you offer, you have different type of pricing within as well. Um, yeah. You know, how, how many times did you change your pricing over the last, uh, like, you know, m many years? Uh, and then, yeah, how did you approach that? Yeah, pricing is always, um, yeah, it's a tricky one. Like for us, uh, we, like you said, we have it based on like the solutions applied. And then we have volume tiers based on the amount of uh, comments that we process during a month. So um, because our costs are also tied to these volumes, it's a component that we wanted to include in the pricing plus as well, like for many clients, uh, their spend on social media is seasonal. So we want them as well as our solution is a subscription. We want them, if they're spending a lot, their price will be higher because they're getting more comments. And then if they're spending less, their price will be lower. Mm -hmm. So I think like ultimately, like we're looking to retain customers. We're looking for super happy customers. So we've really iterated to make a pricing model that it feels as fair and is as fair as possible for the customer and um, for us. I think that's been like a, like a really important part. And then certain things happen, certain things changes 
change on the market and then you know we, we might have to you know adjust but i think just finding something that feels like a win-win is you know mm -hmm. the key thing okay no that's that's fascinating yeah um all right and so in terms of let's say obviously challenges right like what what would you say is a big challenge for you right now um i think recruitment uh is something that uh like we're currently uh, recruiting for a lot of roles where we're kind of growing the team so i think that's something that is um is a challenge um we are working both with like recruitment firms we're also doing our own sourcing and and recruitment uh but i i think that's something that's gotten uh trickier especially as more and more companies are offering like remote work uh it used to be like a key differentiator for us as an employer but it's not something that's more spread out uh i think another challenge is like obviously we work with the social media platforms so we're working with their apis and that's like um you know they're changing things they're making modifications uh, so that requires like an extreme amount of agility from our side um to be able to constantly be up to date when we are so reliant on on these uh, other mm -hmm. companies to be able to provide our solutions mm -hmm. yeah actually i've heard it from another business as well where they had yeah they were like so dependent on facebook's api it was actually a post scheduling software and then for some reason facebook really mm. picked them out and 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 ban them and they have to basically yeah reinvent themselves completely but again that, that maybe they did something wrong so yeah well it can be a challenge yeah i think also yeah and also like last year when x made some changes there were a lot of uh, companies that were able to uh, to stay in business so i think i mean i think i do think the platforms like they offer tons of support and they're really trying to nurture like these type of partnerships but then Obviously, they have to do what makes most sense for them, and that's just mm -hmm. the nature of all of being in, in this game. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then from a personal, uh, I guess, you know, self-development and professional development perspective, I mean, your, your CV, you know, reads amazing on LinkedIn. And one thing I know that you continue to, these, to do these executive uh, programs. So in 2022, you did Harvard. 2020, 2021, you did uh, INSEAD. Yeah, how do you approach that and you know why did you decide to do that yeah i think uh for our company like we really emphasize continuous learning and we're really kind of emphasizing to all our team members that you need to kind of constantly be evolving and learning new things so i think it's really important that the founder and the ceo also uh, lives by example so i try to um every year i try to do like an actual in-person uh, course or in-person learning experience because I, I think that's uh, really important. I also do uh, obviously listen to a lot of podcasts, read a lot of books, like, um, you know, chat with a lot of people to get knowledge. But I think there's something where when you're actually in a room um, with other people that is especially valuable when it's like in a chosen field where you um, really want to develop yourself. So I think mean, that's uh, been really important for myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then you also, we obviously met in the Hampton community by, you know, created by Sam Parr with his podcast, My First Million. So, uh, and then you also in, in the YPO community, I guess, what, what made you go into, yeah, YPO and then Hampton? Like, do you also think it's, you know, a big asset to learn from other people or is there anything else and uh, why you joined these communities? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think it's also very fun here in LA as well. I organize a lot of like entrepreneur brunches, dinners, masterminds, that sort of thing. I think it's just that uh, it's just um, such a great resource for, you know, founders to be able to connect with each other, learn from each other. I also really like the practical aspect of Hampton where people are, um, you know, asking for tool recommendations, like really specific things and, and getting great um, answers. So yeah, I think it's a uh, yeah, no, absolutely. It's a really, um, yeah, strong way of, of uh, like getting friends, getting recommendations, mm -hmm. learning new things. Mm -hmm. And then one other question I was just thinking about in terms of you being a sole founder, and then you mentioned you have a few, uh, you know, angels who've been entrepreneurs before. Um, do you have some sort of like advisory board and then a monthly or quarterly meeting with them where you, you know, have some sort of like accountability or also ask advice? Do you have any mechanisms around that? 
Yeah, so I mean, even if I'm a solo founder, we have, um, you know, a really great leadership team where the team members also are owners of the company. So we do, um, we do a lot of things, uh, like we do a weekly like leadership meeting, um, do a lot of things with the team. We also do these like company offsites once a year. So we're actually, um, in two weeks time, we're going to Athens and Greece with, uh, with the company, um, spend some time together. And then, um, yeah, in terms of, uh, we also have, uh, yeah, we have a board, uh, we do quarterly, um, board meetings where we chat through specific challenges. And then, uh, I always try to look for people who have solved something that I'm looking to solve. Um, so I also kind of reach out to, to people, um, over LinkedIn or over other channels just to understand, um, or like to gain more knowledge about different topics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm actually a big fan also of that you know, reaching out to a person if you need advice on a certain topic rather than, for example, having a very large uh, board of directors uh, and hoping that the same people will always know the answers to all the questions, which is, of course, yeah. impossible. Um, and, you know, yeah. even like switching out advisors, I, I do that quite a bit as well. Yeah. And I think it's just so important, like even when the years go by and, you know, you, you've been like an entrepreneur for a long time to just stay very humble mm -hmm. and just uh, continue having this like beginner's mindset. Um, I think it's, it's very important. Yeah, absolutely. So let's maybe jump into a quick fire of uh, questions. I do that with uh, every podcast guest. So uh, what is a book recommendation of yours for SaaS founders? Um, I'd say Amp It Up by Frank Sweetman. It's an awesome book about really kind of raising the bar, getting the whole like team um, ready for like massive scale. So that's a great book. Mm -hmm. And then uh, who is an entrepreneur who you admire? Well, I really admire uh, Morten Mikos. He's the, he was the CEO of MySQL. Um, yeah, that sold for a billion. Um, he's now the CEO of our crowdsourced um, hacking uh, company called HackerOne. Uh, and more than, yeah, he's also an, an advisor and an investor of Brand Bastion, but he's just, a, I think, an incredible leader. He's also very forward thinking, like already, you know, 20 years ago, he was doing fully remote uh, teams, uh, fully remote hiring, distributed, um, like, and he has a lot of philosophies around um, management that I, I really relate to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Awesome. And in terms of productivity tool and SaaS, something you use, maybe other people don't. Yeah, there's so many uh, different ones, but I think one that we really enjoyed using is, is, uh, for sales, like a tool called wingman, or I think now it might be called Copilot by Clary, but it's a great way where, you know, our sales, um, team, they use it on calls and then we're able to, uh, see a lot of stats around like how much were they talking? Uh, what were some of the like, keywords mentioned and that way we can continuously improve the way that we um, sell and the way that we talk about our solutions. Hmm, that's cool. That's cool. Not heard of that one, but uh, I'll check it out. Um, in terms of who do you want to see on this podcast? Um, I don't know. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I guess, uh, yeah, who do you have coming up? We have, well, we had actually uh, I think last this week we had the founder of tiny seed uh the largest uh, kind of bootstrap d2b SaaS accelerator in the us einar volstedt uh he's actually from norway yeah your nordic neighbor um and he's actually based in the us so that's one and next week we are interviewing um the founder of uh everby who is actually also uh Hampton member. It's a analytics tool for Etsy sellers. Uh, you can, you can say, I don't know, Sam oh. or something, right? <laughs> cool. Well, that, that sounds awesome. I'll be sure to listen to that. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. And then finally, what advice would you give to, you know, the SaaS founders out there? Um, I mean, <laughs> there's so many different types of SaaS founders. So it's, it's hard to give like any, kind of uh, one fit all advice. Um, but I think there's like, a, there's a country song uh, called The Gambler, 
where there's like this chorus that says like you need to know when to fold, uh, when to hold, when to walk away and when to run. And that's something that I've had in my head for a long time. And I think it's especially important when building like a high growth company and just being able to identify like when are situations when you really need to like double down, go all in. And when are situations where you just kind of need to wait or when you actually need to leave. And I think that's kind of one of the being able to identify and to develop like an intuition around these sort of things, I think is one of the key things that makes a successful founder like long term. Um, because you can't continuously go all in because your energy resource will run out and you'll be focusing on too many things. So really kind of um, developing that skill is, is key. I had that mm -hmm. song and those lyrics in the back of my head um, mm -hmm. multiple times mm -hmm. uh, during the course of a month. Cool, cool. Yeah, no, that's a good one. Basically, also, yeah, cho choose your battles, right, basically as well. Um, amazing. Well, yeah. thank you so much. If people want to, you know, reach out to you, where can they find you? Um, they can find me on LinkedIn or on Instagram or my email is uh, Jenny at Bastion.com. So. Amazing. Cool. Well, thanks so much. And yeah, good luck. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks for sticking around. If you want to see the show notes, please go to neoptima.com slash SaaS podcast. Otherwise, see you at the next episode. Bye.